when pollen becomes super pollen. We have about 150 different grass species and they all flower at different times. Antarctica's missing ice. The extent of sea ice around the Antarctic dropped to its lowest level ever in the satellite record in February this year. And recognising scientific excellence. There's lots of science to be understood, lots of cultural and uh, people dynamics to deal with. It's Friday the 10th of June and you're listening to Weathersnap from the Met Office. Hello, I'm Claire Nazir. Welcome to Weathersnap, an insider's guide to the week's weather headlines. Across the world, there are seasonal events that wax and wane. India's southwest monsoons, tornadoes in the United States. Right now in the UK, it's pollen that's grabbing the headlines, with forecasts currently ranging from high to very high, and even talk of something called super pollen. To find out more, I spoke to Met Office pollen expert Yolanda Clulo. Yolanda, people are suffering right now. The pollen count keeps going up and up. Is this the peak of the season? And have we had peaks before and will there be others? So usually grass season follows quite a consistent pattern and there tends to be two peaks, one sort of in the first half of June and then another one early in July. And that's because we have about 150 different grass species and they all flower at different times and only some of them are allergenic, you know, cause allergy. Uh, the vast majority don't and we don't know exactly. We're getting better at understanding which ones are the allergenic ones, but we don't fully understand yet. And they all flower slightly differently. So it can there's a lot of variation and the intensity of each season varies according to the preceding weather. So this year, for example, we had a very good growing season in May. It was lovely and warm, wet. So we've had lots of growth, although that's not strictly reflected in the number of grains in the air. We have had much higher numbers in the past. But this year, we think the potency of these pollen grains is more intense. It's made headline news pollen this week in terms of what some of the press are calling super pollen referring to storms and storm fever. Could you add any clarity to those phrases and is there any substance to it? These phrases, and I think of previous years, we've had one called pollen bomb and thunder fever, and we've had all sorts of terms. These aren't actually scientific names, they're media terms, but they're all related to a phenomenon called thunderstorm asthma. And this is something that isn't well understood globally. It's an active area of research with our health partners. And we're trying to understand the exact mechanisms and the conditions that lead to these huge episodes where people with respiratory problems, asthma and hay fever, can have large exacerbations in their symptoms. So these thunderstorms, they're very specific and it's not every thunderstorm, are related to when the pollen is high. We're trying to unpick all of that and identify which storms cause this phenomenon, and so that in the future we'll be able to forecast for them. I do suffer from hay fever, Yolanda, but only in the last like five years, and it's been tree pollen, never suffered as a child. Is that unusual? That's yeah. really common, actually. Often people get allergic as a child, and then they grow out of it as an adult, and the opposite is true. People can never have any symptoms, and then as an adult suddenly become allergic to pollen like you, but often it will go after a number of years. But we don't really know why. Finally, where can we get more information about the daily pollen forecast? Obviously, the best place I would say is going to be the Met Office website. We've got map and information. You can download the app and you can get, um, what do they call, push notifications. So you can put in your location and you can get an alert direct to your phone when your specific pollen type is high or very high in your location. Yolanda Clulo, thank you very much. Sea ice in polar regions varies with the seasons. In wintertime, ice cover builds and then retreats again in summer. It's important for scientists to monitor sea ice as it's a key indicator of climate change. A new report released by the British Antarctic Survey has revealed sea ice in Antarctica hit a record low back in February, with one million square kilometres less coverage than the long-term average. To put that into perspective, that's an area approximately four times the size of the UK. 
The report's author is Professor John Turner, and he described the findings to climate correspondent Graham Madge. We were fascinated to see that the extent of sea ice around the Antarctic dropped to its lowest level ever in the satellite record in February this year. So we really wanted to know why this had occurred. And we found that there was really two reasons for this. Sea ice is very thin. It's only about one metre in depth. And there's a huge annual cycle in sea ice between about 3 million square kilometres at the minimum in February and 18 million square kilometres at the maximum in September. So most Antarctic sea ice forms fresh each year, so it's very thin, very sensitive. And we found really that it drops so low because of very intense storms at a critical time in the annual cycle. And secondly, because winds around the continent were very strong. The Southern Ocean around Antarctica has always lots and lots of storms. It's an extremely stormy place because Antarctica is extremely cold, the tropics are very warm, and so there's a huge amount of potential energy around the Antarctic. And late last year, there were storms of exceptional strength. And at a critical time of the year, because we get the maximum amount of heat going into the ocean, into the environment of the Antarctic in December. And sea ice is very reflective. It's, uh, it's white, it reflects most of the energy from the sun. The ocean is black almost, and so absorbs a lot of heat. And these storms that we had, in October and November last year, they blew a lot of sea ice away from the Antarctic, opening up the ocean. And heat got in and really warmed the ocean. And then that's when you get the ice albedo feedback kicking in. In other words, the highly reflective snow and ice had gone. And so the heat got into the ocean, warmed up the ocean, and that gave more melting of sea ice. I think most people would associate lower extent of Antarctic sea ice with effects linked to rising global temperatures. But it appears that increased storminess also has a major role in year to year variability. Was that a surprise? Yes, because we've seen that the temperature, the mean temperature of the world increasing, but that hasn't happened in the Antarctic. We've seen major warming right across the Arctic Ocean, but not around the Antarctic. People didn't realise when the ozone hole formed in the 1980s that it would inhibit the impact of increasing greenhouse gases. So most temperatures around the Antarctic haven't increased. You mentioned there, John, a very interesting association between the ozone hole and Antarctic temperatures. Could you explain a little bit more about that? Yes, well, before the 1980s, we had uh, an ozone layer above Antarctica, about 20, 25 kilometres and that absorbed a lot of energy from the sun and uh, it kept it relatively warm above the Antarctic. But from the early 1980s, the CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, this anthropogenically emitted gas, destroys the ozone above the Antarctic each spring. And so in fact, temperatures have cooled above the Antarctic. And really the whole climate system of the Southern Hemisphere is driven by the fact that we have a very cold Antarctica and very high temperatures in the tropics. So that's energised the whole system. The winds around the Antarctic over the Southern Ocean have increased by about 20%. And so that's also carried a lot of sea ice out of the Weddell Sea embayment uh, in the Antarctic. What are the major impacts on the continent and its wildlife from this record low sea ice extent? Sea ice is really important uh, for many different aspects of the, of the wildlife. Um, Penguins breed on this sea ice, um, birds use it. Um, we get krill. Krill are shrimp-like creatures that are a very important part of the food chain in the Antarctic. And they breed under the sea ice. And so sea ice affects the range that uh, penguins can, can forage. I think it's really the long-term change that would have a big impact on the seals and uh, on, on, on the penguins down there. But sea ice is also very important for the oceanography because um, the world's most dense saline water mass is produced in the Antarctic coastal area. And the Weddell Sea to the east of the Antarctic Peninsula is a, is a primary area where this extremely dense water mass is produced because when sea ice forms, it rejects brine and salt that sinks into the ocean, producing this extremely heavy, dense water mass, which then travels north right up the Atlantic and so sea ice is a really important player in the global ocean circulation. So as we expect to lose sea ice over the coming decades, it will have an impact globally 
And so that's one of the reasons we're really interested in understanding the variability and change in sea ice. Professor John Turner talking to climate correspondent Graham Madge. And Graham's full interview with John will be published next week on our Mostly Climate podcast channel. Polar Research made headlines in a different way this week when it was announced that Dr Helene Hewitt, CI scientist here at the Met Office, has been awarded an OBE for her work studying oceans, sea level rise and the cryosphere. For Helene, the announcement came as quite a surprise. Very unexpected, uh, but very much appreciated. I'd put so much work into IPCC over the last four years. I've worked on oceans and climate for the last 25 years. So I'm so humbled to receive the honour, but very excited to meet the royal family, to collect the medal. And they have so many great actions they're taking part in, you know, towards the green agenda. You were a lead author on the IPCC sixth assessment report. What was the greatest challenge for you? Because it's not just writing the report, it's so much more than that. Yes, on an assessment report, you're bringing together, in our case, 25 or so authors from different countries on different time zones. There's lots of science to be understood, lots of cultural and uh, people dynamics to deal with. But on a scientific level, some of the really big questions that we were looking into were the role of ice sheets in the future of uh, sea level projections. Uh, And that's a really critical question. Are there more women coming into climate science now than, say, 10, 20, 30 years ago? Absolutely. You know, I I mean, I started my career as a mathematician, very few women in in that area. The number of women has increased and particularly women who've moved up the career ladder. And I spend a lot of my time trying to mentor other female climate scientists. And uh, so I hope I've played my part in encouraging that. From a public point of view, do you think how people perceive climate scientists has altered or transitioned? I think an understanding that climate is changing is much more in the minds of the general public. So when I tell people now that I work on oceans and climate, people understand it. People generally say now that's, you know, a a really valuable thing that you're doing. So it's definitely a very different place to work now. Helene, thank you so much for your time and congratulations again from everybody here at the WeatherSnap team. Congratulations. Thank you so much, Claire. Well, pollen levels are high, but how are we fixed for weather more generally this weekend? Here with the details, Aidan McGiven. A windy weekend for many of us as an unseasonably deep area of low pressure passes close to the north of Scotland. Having said that, much of England and Wales will see plenty of sunshine during Saturday morning and it will stay mostly dry with just the odd shower for western and northern England as well as Wales into the afternoon. But for Scotland and Northern Ireland, it's a different story. Here, frequent showers will move through during the day. And for Western Scotland, some longer spells of rain at times. It will be a wet day for the West Highlands. And it will also be a windy day, especially for northern parts of the UK. That wind bouncing over the hills of North Wales, Northern England and Scotland. And we'll see gale force winds around exposed coasts of Western Scotland and over some of the Highlands and the Pennines. Now, that wind will make it feel cool towards the northwest, particularly when you factor in the showers that will be coming through through the day. But further south, out of the wind for southern and eastern parts of England, still the potential for temperatures to reach 22 to 24 Celsius. Into Saturday night, further spells of rain or showers will affect northwestern areas. But by Sunday, the low pressure to the north will be easing away and it will be filling. As a result, Sunday is a little less windy. Still a breezy day for many and still some showers arriving, particularly for northern parts of the UK. But the showers won't be as heavy or as frequent. The wind won't be as strong. There'll be a better chance of some sunshine coming through and it will feel warm enough in the south and the east temperatures still reaching the low 20s. Thanks, Aidan. Just before we go, Martin Bowles is here with last week's highs and lows. Here are the UK weather extremes recorded between Monday the 30th of May and Sunday the 5th of June. The highest temperature of the week was 24.8 degrees Celsius measured at Gosport in Hampshire on Friday. 
The coldest place was Altnahara in Sutherland, where minus 1.5 degrees was measured early on Thursday. The maximum daily rainfall was 41.8 mm at the Royal Navy Air Station at Yeovilton in Somerset on Friday. The largest amount of daily sunshine was 16.4 hours at Stornoway on the Isle of Lewis in the Western Isles on Thursday. Thanks, Martin. That's it for Weather Snap. I'm Claire Nazir. Editor is Adrian Holloway. Weather Snap is a podcast by the UK Met Office. For the latest weather conditions where you are, download the Met Office weather app.